Heathcliff? Oh, Heathcliff. Two and a half years ago, I released a miniature retrospective about Garfield the Cat, one of my favorite characters growing up who is now looked at as something peculiar by most people. Since then, I have continued to release other videos about niche topics in the Garfield iceberg, from movie adaptations to lost media. But there's one specific angle that I've never really tried to tackle before, mostly because it really isn't about Garfield at all. You see, for every action, there must be a reaction. For every ying, there has to be a yang. For every good, there must be evil. And for every Garfield, there is Heathcliff. Yes, these two cankerous orange cats are constantly cursed to tango in the public discourse. Like Batman and Superman, Mario and Sonic, and Dennis the Menace and Dennis the Menace. There's always been this lingering question in the air. Who is the superior tabby? The lasagna lover from Muncie? Or... the other one? What's his deal? You see, Heathcliff has become rather infamous recently for having comics which literally do not make sense. Take this one for instance, Heathcliff is wearing a helmet that says ham, and the guy at the counter says, don't order ham, okay? Then we have these two comics, where Heathcliff is wearing a hat that says gravy on Thanksgiving. Okay, so in the Heathcliff universe, you wear helmets for what food you like. All right, weird joke. But then look at this. In this comic, Heathcliff is wearing a helmet that says dirt. Does, does Heathcliff eat dirt? And then in this one, everyone is wearing helmets that say family. What do the helmets mean? There's a lot of jokes like that in modern Heathcliff, like visual gags that go unexplained, perhaps visual puns that you spend half an hour trying to figure out that might not even be there. And perhaps there is no more a perplexing example of this in the Heathcliff lore than Garbage Ape. Cats rejoice at the Garbage Ape's approach. He loves a visit from the Garbage Ape. They like the garbage ape. Be of good cheer, it's the garbage ape. The garbage ape's work is done here. I wonder if it's garbage flavored. I can't lie to you guys and tell you that I understand garbage ape in any particular meaning. He is an enigma, a parody of the idea of a joke making sense. But God damn it, do I love Garbage Ape. And if anything has inspired me to make this video, it's this specific character. And that's why today we're going to be taking a Quentin Leap back into the history of America's fifth favorite cat. But first, I want to pose a question. Have you ever had this problem? You, you want to check out that new book that you've heard so much about. You really do, but you just don't have the time because the quarantine has stopped you from going out to a store and getting a new pair of reading glasses. And you would switch to audiobooks, you know you would, but you just can't find a good pair of earbuds that maintain premium quality but at nearly half of premium price. And furthermore, you're so stressed about the worry about if the CIA is secretly spying on you. And you wonder, how can I possibly keep my data secure. This video is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. Raid Shadow Legends is the greatest free-to-play fantasy RPG to come out in the last 45 years, and boy howdy am I excited by it. Now why do I love Raid Shadow Legends? Well boy, I, I just wish I had a series of pre-rendered graphics to show you why it's great. It's one game. The game is Raid Shadow Legends, but there's two ways to play. On mobile and on desktop, and ten challenging dungeons with different enemies to fight and battle. This is my favorite one. Twelve campaign locations across the map. Thirteen powerful factions to join and discover, like like elves and, and 460 unique champions and 200,000 active clans to join and 25 5 million players and unlimited customization and endless strategies on how to play Raid Shadow. The video's over. Today is officially the 320th day in a row that I have been playing Raid Shadow Legends. I've gotten all my original champions and a couple others all the way up to level 60, and I'm training others to try and improve my team. 
and there has never been a better time to start playing Raid because the latest patch has added in the Doom Tower. It's just a giant tower with 120 floors, a bunch of secret challenge rooms, and 12 seriously badass bosses to take on. Sorry for cursing my fellow Christian gamers, I'm just really excited. And if you want to get a huge head start in Raid, all you have to do is go hit the link in the description down below to get a free Void Champion, an XP booster, 50 gems, some refill energy, and even an ancient shard as soon as you get in the game. If you sign up now, you'll also be able to get the free champion, Bulwark, but you'll only be able to find these gifts in your inbox for the first 30 days. So act now and get on board with the epicness of Raid Shadow Legends. Also, don't forget to go down to the description and hit subscribe if you haven't yet. Just make sure you're subscribed. It means a lot, and if we can get to 400,000 subscribers by December 25th, then I'm gonna do a review of uh, uh, Game Shakers or or Fallen Titans Clippy or whatever he uh, whatever I said, you know. Uh, but anyways, let's get into this. George Gately was born on December the 21st, 1928 in Queens Village, New York. However, he primarily grew up in Bergenfield, New Jersey. Like Jim Davis, he found work at an advertising agency after graduating from college, but didn't find it creatively satisfying. So he began working on comics across the country. His early work includes Hapless Harry, about a large oaf who is subject to misfortune, and Hippie, a satire of hippie culture. But his most famous work would of course be An Orange Cat with Stripes. Heathcliff first premiered on the 3rd of September 1973 in a small collection of newspapers across the United States. The first comic is strange and vague out of context, but throughout the next several weeks, the strip would begin to give some insight into the status quo of the world being presented. Heathcliff is owned by an elderly woman named Mrs. Nutmeg, who is one of the only characters in the series who seems to generally approve of him. Her husband, Mr. Nutmeg, is usually depicted being quite fed up with his antics and very willing to get rid of him. You say you found a large, striped, cantankerous tomcat. Finders keepers! Heathcliff was born in an alleyway before being rescued by his current owners, leading him to have quite a tough exterior, but with a spoiled nature. The nutmegs are also trying to raise their apparently orphaned grandson, Iggy, who is another person that Heathcliff strongly identifies with. If I were to call Heathcliff a knockoff or derivative of any comic, I wouldn't choose Garfield, which of course wouldn't be created for three more years, but instead the comic it was usually printed directly next to, The Family Circus. While a few comics in the first year did go for a multi-panel story, the comic quickly settled on a very cutesy, one-panel style which you probably most quickly associate with The Circus Family. The kind of comic where you look at the art, read the caption, and look at the art again and go, oh, well that's not very funny. But I will admit that there is something subversive about many of these early comics just by virtue of them sometimes doing jokes that you wouldn't see in similar strips. Greetings, Earthling. The joke of the series is essentially that while this elderly woman sees Heathcliff as the comfort in her life and something truly special, he immediately becomes a total nuisance to everyone else, outright terrifying his neighborhood through his overt cattiness. What happened to Heathcliff scratching post? Now quit that. Battle stations! We're missing a penguin. It's a very peaceful neighborhood. With one exception. He certainly has made a name for himself in this town. God bless Grandma, God bless Grandpa, and God forgive Heathcliff. Alongside terrorizing mailmen, milkmen, and dogs, Heathcliff also proves himself to be quite a playboy, with many early comics illustrating him romancing any female cat he meets resulting in love triangle after love triangle. I cannot be any more clear that this is not an exaggeration. Heathcliff fucks. Several early comics feature images of Sonia, his main bee, giving birth to litters of tiny Heathcliffs, much to the annoyance of Sonia's owner, who also hates the orange cat with a passion. I will say that there are far too many middle-aged, mustachioed guys to get angry at Heathcliff. It's like completely pointless trying to keep track of them because they're all the same. 
I still, however, have not touched upon my favorite aspect of early Heathcliff comics, and I once again cannot clarify enough that I am not exaggerating when I say this. Heathcliff hates cops. This isn't something that happens once or twice or in like a multi-week arc. It's like a consistent joke that the author keeps pulling from time and time again. Heathcliff antagonizes members of the police force. He rips up police uniforms for fun. He singles out police dogs to bully on the street. And perhaps that character trait starts to make a little more sense when you consider his extended family. You see, as we find out in 1977, Heathcliff's father is currently incarcerated, or at least he's supposed to be. The implication of most of the comics with this character is that Heathcliff's father is supposed to be in prison and he sometimes breaks out to see Heathcliff and then ends up going back. Which, which can we just analyze the implication of that being true? Because it seems like Heathcliff is wanted by the police all the time in his comics. Constantly being wanted for theft or harassment, and every single time they capture Heathcliff, put him in a jail cell for a few hours, hold a little mock trial, and then just bring him back to Mrs. Nutmeg. But Heathcliff's dad? No, 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 no. We're gonna take this goddamn cat off the streets, we're gonna put him in a tiny striped jumpsuit, and we're gonna put him in a maximum security prison. Think about how bad his crimes against humanity must be that that's the kind of treatment he gets. Keeping in mind that it's implied in numerous comics that Heathcliff himself has committed crimes much worse than just stealing fish. Level with me, KC. I hear you guys nailed Mr. Big. Thinking of expanding your territory again? He walks slow when he's packing iron. What about this $700 in your mattress? By the late 1970s, Heathcliff was widespread enough in the newspaper industry that he started getting some other brand recognition. This is, for instance, when he first started getting a lot of merchandise. Now, I'm only bringing up Heathcliff merchandise to talk about the fact that it's really hard to find Heathcliff merchandise where he looks like Heathcliff. Look at this! Look at this! Look at this! Look! This is Heathcliff! But it was specifically in 1980 that Heathcliff made the bold transition to television with his TV show. Heathcliff and Dingbat. Now I know what you're thinking. What the fuck is a Dingbat? You see, back in the day, people figured that newspaper comics were not enough to adapt into a full 22 minute program, so most newspaper comic shows had like a second half that had nothing to do with the first. So in its first season, Heathcliff was packaged with Dingbat and the Creeps. Then the show became Heathcliff and Marmaduke. You get the idea. To celebrate, let's all have your colored creep pie! <laughs> ah! Chocolate creep pie! Oh no! You. you creeps! I told you never to show me food! I think I made a blue blue! Now, the most significant change that happened during the adaptation of Heathcliff from a comic strip to a TV show is that the titular character gained a voice, and specifically was voiced by a legendary actor, Mel Blanc. You were observed robbing the fish market. But I've been home all day. My horoscope said it would be dangerous to go out. Yeah, well, I'm a Scorpio. We don't believe in astrology. But look, I got innocence written all over me. That's a likely story. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, they sure don't make the jails like they used to. I've seen a lot of people say that Heathcliff was Mel Blanc's last original voice role, which means it was the last voice he developed. He never played a character that he hadn't played before after that. Um, this seems like it's probably definitely not true, because with a voice actor that prolific, you'd figure their last original voice would be like Smurf number 12, you know what I mean? Um... But, uh, yeah, let's pretend it's true. Yeah, what a, what a neat fact. It's really a shame that I don't have any positive thing to say about this performance, because in my humble opinion, I think giving Heathcliff a voice ruins the charm and the gimmick of his entire character. His comic works because he's a vague, chaotic force without motivation. Going out of your way to make him talk and shout and sing and talk about his feelings just feels like it's removing the very essence of the cattiness that was present in his persona. 
Like, I feel like the running joke of him secretly being a mobster is a lot less funny when you imagine that he talks like Meatwad. The 1980s show seems like it went over fine, but in 1984 he got a second show, and it seems like this is the one that really captivated the imagination of pop culture. The show was occasionally known as Heathcliff and the Cadillac Cats, and featured a really interesting take on that universe. Once again, to divide up the time slot, a new cast was introduced to the program who filled out the second half of the show. That being Cats and Company, or the Cadillac Cats. These segments would be set in the same town as Heathcliff, and on some occasions Heathcliff and the gang would cross over for various mischief. Now here's where things get weird. It seems to me whenever you bring up Heathcliff to people, there's like a 50-50 chance the first thing they'll think of is the Cadillac Cats. And that's really strange, because there's no other comic where that happens. When you bring up Garfield to someone, they don't go, Hey, is that the show with the egg that walks on two legs? No! They know Garfield for Garfield. But people seem to associate Heathcliff with this secondary piece of media that has nothing to do with the source material. Personally, I tried to watch some of it, and I just don't get it. Maybe because I'm not a furry? I just don't get the Clash in art style. I think it's really ugly. Like, some of the characters are like real cats. They're short and, and fat and chibi, and they look like animals. And then some of the cats in the show are six feet tall, and they have muscles and pants. It just looks bad to me. Around this time, there was also a Marvel Comics adaptation that went on for a strangely high amount of issues, which stuck to the pre-existing canon of the comics and not the TV shows. Now, there's arguably a pretty clear reason why someone making a Heathcliff TV show would try pretty hard to make it not like the comics at all. And that's because there's one phenomenally obvious side of Heathcliff history which we haven't touched upon yet. And that is that in January 1976, in a bug-failed, fueled stupor, Jim Davis first drew and then immediately premiered... Garfield the Cat. Now, I imagine it's not hard to tell that from the beginning, these two characters didn't initially have a lot in common. Heathcliff was mute. Garfield talked to the audience. Heathcliff was orange with black stripes, and Garfield was stripeless in a black and white comic. Garfield had a fleshed out human cast who defined most of the early comics, and Heathcliff had a revolving door cast of humans so forgettable that I didn't even know there were humans in the comic until I started reading them. But within just a few years, everything changed. Suddenly, Heathcliff was talking, and Garfield was orange with black stripes. And while they both started out walking on all fours, they both then evolved to be exclusively bipedal. And you can very easily argue that Garfield either subconsciously or on purpose took inherent inspiration from Heathcliff. However, you can make the exact same argument in reverse. Here's my key piece of evidence for this. These are a series of books that were printed throughout the 1970s that featured Heathcliff comics. So you can see that they're all the same, they have a distinct style, they feature the Heathcliff stories, but they look like regular books. You can just put them on your shelf. But then, in 1980, the first Garfield book came out, and it looked like this. This was a design that Jim Davis came up with so he could print his comics as they were intended to be seen, from left to right. And these specific books were what made Garfield a household name, because they were much better designed than other similar books, they were very flashy, and most importantly, they made great gifts for kids. And one year later, Heathcliff began printing his books like this. Now, don't these just look like Garfield books? I mean, literally the whole joke of this book is that it's bragging about the fact that Heathcliff is technically more popular than Garfield. But you can understand why they would want to do this, because despite the fact that it made him second fiddle, Garfield most likely made Heathcliff a lot easier to sell, both to children and investors in shady boardroom meetings. And that's probably the reason he got a second show all of a sudden, and it's also probably the reason the second show is so weird and has nothing to do with the source material, because they were trying to make it less like Garfield, despite marketing it to be similar to Garfield. Does that make sense? I'm blowing steam. I often do. But throughout all of this, amazingly, from what I can tell, the Heathcliff comic just kept going along, and it didn't change at all. 
Heathcliff still didn't talk. He didn't get a new cast of wacky friends. It was just sort of the same shtick as the 1970s comics, but continuing on and on. In 2001, George Gately passed away, but his work was continued by his nephew, Peter Gallagher, who still draws the comic today. It remains a surreal and experimental comic, even if sometimes at the expense of not making sense. And if you want to know if I now understand Garbage Ape having gone through this voyage, the answer is no. Thank you for reminding me of my failures. But now that we're at the end here, what's my final judgment? What do I think of Heathcliff the Cat? Well, I think people are going to be shocked to hear this, but I really like the character a lot. In fact, I've been studying the world and the character so long and thinking about all the nuanced details, all the moving parts, and... I'm really in love. I mean, just all the details like his father being incarcerated and his, his owner not being fond of him. And I think I've come to the conclusion that Heathcliff is better than Garfield. Because Garfield is just so boring and repetitive. It's been the same thing for like 50 years. And I I'm just tired of the incel adventures of John Arbuckle trying to get a date. And I Heathcliff, meanwhile, he's avant-garde. He's mysterious. He's out there. He's so cool. And he beats up cops. And in my humble opinion, that makes him leagues above his fat imitator. With that, I've been Quentin Reviews. And that's all you be. Hey Quentin, have you heard about the amazing new mobile app, Raid Shadow Legends? I'm getting my gun. Thanks for watching this one, guys. Remember to hit subscribe to see that episode of Fallen Titans Clippy or whatever the fuck. And be sure to click one of these playlists or videos when they pop up at the end of the video. And as always, I've been Quentin Reviews. Found it. I gotta go. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, stand still, goddammit. Hey Heathcliff, eat your heart out.